We're going to call our, our series The King and His Kingdom. And the reason we're doing that is because the, the message are going to be directed to, to the larger mission of the church. We're going to be talking about God's kingdom. We're going to be discussing what Jesus thinks about souls, which means we're going to be looking at this subject of eternity and how important it is that we understand it and how important it is that we share it. And we're going to be doing it all the while by looking at what Jesus does. He challenges the prevailing view of the religious ideas, the religious community of his day. So let me tell you what I want to do this morning, okay? I'm going to take most of this morning and bring an introduction to you. I want to talk to you about parables for a little while, okay? Maybe, uh, hopefully, give you some information uh, maybe, uh, in a sense, whet your appetite for what our, our team's going to be sharing with you. And then I'm going to take you to the Old Testament. And I want to give you an illustration of a parable that we find in the Old Testament. It's an illustration of King David. It's a tough and it's a challenging passage of Scripture. But I just felt God's leadership to start there. And what I'm going to do is when I get through the introduction, I'm going to take us there. And we're going to read this parable that was given to King David. And then I'm going to try to lift out of this example or this illustration some practical areas. One of the, the, the things I think we should do as, as pastors and preachers and, and teachers is we take the scriptures as they're written to, to who it's written to. And we, we are to teach the truth of that. But at the same time, we're to try to lift out applications I don't, I don't want you, and Matt and Kyle, we don't want you leaving here just with information. We want to leave you, want you to leave here kind of challenged a little bit with what's going to happen on Monday or Tuesday. Or uh, if you have a bad Thursday, everybody has uh, a bad Wednesday. That's the day when we try to break over hump day to get over. But we want to give you something to try to take with you. It may encourage you in some respects. My, my hope is that it, it challenges you uh, in, in your life. And so we're going to take this illustration. We're going to talk about some tough stuff with David. And then I'm going to give you some things that at least when you leave here today and you go home and you, you might think about it a little bit, it might, might challenge you uh, uh, just a little bit, okay? I want to begin by, by asking some questions. And then hopefully during the introduction, I'm going to answer them if I don't email me or text me and say, you confused me, and, I, and I'll answer. I'm good at that, uh, but I'm going to try to answer these questions. First of all, what is a parable? And I'm going to attempt to define parables in just a moment. When Jesus uses parables, what was his intention? You see, Jesus just didn't tell stories. Every story that Jesus told had a purpose to it, had some intention behind it, okay? What do parables challenge us to think, but more than think? What do parables challenge us to do, okay? I think we all would agree that stories are part of everyday language. Usually when a, a speaker begins to speak, he'll invariably use pictures as he tries to bring out what he's trying to say. And Jesus was a master of that, wasn't he? If Matt, Matt, uh, if Matt didn't have a whiteboard and a grease marker or a, uh, whatever they're called, I don't know that he could communicate. Because every time we get together and we talk about church, we talk about the future or something we're wanting to do, the first thing Matt does, he grabs a, a marker and he goes to the whiteboard and he begins to draw out what he's trying to say. That's a, that's a vivid illustration of what he's trying to communicate to me or his dreams or desires for where we as a church are going. Well, that's what Jesus did. He, he, was, he was the master of it. However, let me say again to you that the pictures that he gives to us are not just stories to enhance his message. What Jesus is trying to do is to drive home a truth. And what he does, he forces the reader to look deeply into his soul for some kind of challenge or some kind of uh, uh, adjustment that might need to be made. 30% of all the teachings of our Lord were in parables. 
And what he would do is he would take a picture of everyday life, a picture that everybody, frankly, would connect to, and then he would drive home a spiritual truth. Some have defined parables this way, uh, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and and I I think that's a a great uh, definition of it. See, the stories of Christ are designed for people to think about God and where they stand with God. And so if we accomplish what we hope to accomplish over the next three months, we want to force you to answer this question, who is God in my life? Where then do I stand with God? A.W. Tozer, a great preacher of years gone by, said when it, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about our lives. I like that. When we think of God, It tells us what we think about our lives and who God is. And so we're going to be forcing ourselves to really determine these next three months what we think about God and where we stand. Now, as we begin, let me give you some rules that I think we have to follow. If we're going to to do this parable study right, then I, I think it would enhance us to know what the rules of parable studies are. By the way, the word parable literally means to throw beside. And so what a parable does, it's a story that's placed alongside of truth for understanding, not just for knowledge, but for action. So that when we walk away from the parable, or if we we read the parable and set it down, we're we're forced perhaps to, to do something or to take some action in our lives according to the truth that Jesus just gave us, and Jesus illustrated it to us through the parable. So let me give you like four different rules that we're going to attempt to follow. The first one is this. We can't divorce ourselves from the Jewish culture back in that day. And I got to tell you, that's more of the challenge for us as teachers than it will be for you as listeners, okay? The Western world today is vastly different than the Jewish world back then. And so part of our study in, in, in our office, in our study, wherever we do our work, part of the challenge we're going to have is to realize what the context is, where Jesus was, who was he speaking to, what was he trying to get across, and bring this, this culture then into today's culture. And in a way that we hope you can understand. And so, therefore, I want to covet your prayers. Uh, We've got to somehow figure out what he's doing then so that we can apply it now. And so in your morning quiet time, I know all of you pray for about an hour, an hour and a half every morning, right? And you spend two hours reading your Bible before you go to work, right? Well, somehow in this early morning time, even if it's at breakfast, you might just bow your head and say, God, today I want to pray for Tom or Matt or Kyle as we begin to unpack the the truth of the, the context of what we're talking about in the parable. Number two, this is important for you. Parables tell one main truth. Parables have one main purpose that we have to capture. We, as your teachers, you as the listener, one main purpose that we've got to capture. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not secondary truths, and we'll probably bring some of those out. I mean, if we just, if we just worked on one truth, it'd be like a 15-minute sermon, and we don't want 15-minute sermons, do we? No, no, we don't, okay? So there'll be some secondary truths that, that we'll bring out. But we got to grab what Jesus is saying. And I hope I can do that for you this morning in the Old Testament illustration. Number three, we should not look for deep, hidden, or symbolic meanings. A parable is different than an allegory. If you were to read uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, that's allegorical. Everything in that, in that story has some kind of a different meaning. But a parable isn't like that. A parable has one meaning. 
as I said, and so we want to capture that, and we'll try to do that. I, I hope that, that as I do my part, and as Matt does his part, and as Kyle does his part, we'll say to you, here's the main meaning. Here's the purpose of this parable, okay? And then number four, parables are not meant to build doctrines. Parables are stories to help us understand Jesus' teaching. They just simply illustrate truth. They, they shed light on truth. And so part of the goal we have as we begin to walk through in Matthew, Mark, and Luke these parables, we hope a, a, maybe a light bulb will come on with you that the, as the light of, of revelation comes on, you're going to be able to see some things in the parable that's going to help you in life, okay? Now, let me answer this question. What are parables to us? Well, I was reading the other day, and I, I stumbled across something that, that someone put out, and I like it. He said two things. He said, first of all, parables are, are mirrors. And you know what a mirror is, mirror is, right? Every morning you get up, you go into the bathroom, and this big piece of glass is facing you. It's a mirror. And you look at that mirror, and you say, that's me? And it's not so much a statement as it's a question. I can't look like that, can I? And that's what a parable does. It's a mirror. Yesterday, I had a lot of honeydews to do. And so I got up early to get all my stuff done. And I had some things I needed to do. And I put on my baseball cap. And uh, I did everything I needed to do, you know, kind of thing. Well, in the evening, I came in. And, and Paul and I were in the bathroom. And I... Uh, I was getting ready to kind of go, go to bed, and I took off my hat and threw it down, and I looked in the mirror, and my hair was sticking straight up. I thought, oh, my stars, do I really look like that? Well, that's what a parable does. It pours in, it bores into our soul, and it makes us answer the question, is this me? Is, is Jesus, as he shares this parable, is Jesus talking about me now, we know some of the parables were directed to the hypocrites. And so I want to suggest, am I hypocritical in, in this area of my life? It's a mirror that reflects who I am. Number two, it's a window. You see, parables not only reveal who we are, but parables reveal who God is. Parables show us the heart of God. Divine love and pleasure, divine holiness and judgment. And beloved, listen to me. When you look into the heart of God, you can't be indifferent to that. You can't be in neutral to that. When you, when you get a glimpse of God and you peer into the heart of God and what gives Him divine pleasure and what, what brings out His divine judgment... If that doesn't impact you, if it doesn't cause you to ask yourself some questions, then you've got a really big spiritual problem. Your problem is more than whether you're walking with Christ. Your, your, your challenge is, am I really part of his family, you see? Because when you capture the heart of God, you can't be the same again. That's what parables do for us. Now, having said that, let me give you an illustration. Turn in your Bible to 2 Samuel. Actually, the main text is 12, 2 Samuel 12. But we're going to probably in a minute start in chapter 11, okay? And we're going to talk about a parable that was given to David by the prophet Nathan. And if you grew up in church at all, you probably know the story of, of David and Bathsheba, right? It's a toughie. David uh, committed a wicked sin so wrapped up in it that he basically covered it up for a year. And so wrapped up in this sin for this year, he didn't write any songs, first of all. But when confronted by Nathan, the prophet, he didn't even recognize that this parable was about him. He missed the main purpose in the parable. And that's why we're going to look at it so that we can be challenged by it. He committed adultery. And then he committed murder. 
And listen, beloved, the murder was just not at anybody. The murder was against one of his best men, Uriah the Hittite. You see, David killed a man who every day put his life on the line for the king. You think about that. So wrapped up in his sin and so wrapped up in his cover-up that he was willing to take his best man, the guy who every day would go out into the front lines knowing that he may never come back to his wife. And David killed him because of the sin in his life. And I want to submit to you, that's, that's tough stuff. And what even makes it worse, he didn't even realize that what God was ready to deal with him, he didn't even realize it was him. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word? 2 Samuel, let's begin 2 Samuel 11. Let's read verses 1 through 5, and then we'll turn the page. Uh, did I say 1 Samuel? I mean 2 Samuel. What did I say? It's 2 Samuel. What did, did I say 1 Samuel? I said 2. Okay, when you get my age, sometimes you say things you don't know what you say. 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 5. All right, here we go. Then it happened in the spring. At the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel. And they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But notice the Bible says, David stayed at Jerusalem. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed. He walked around on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers, and he took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanliness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Would you turn the page with me to... 2 Samuel 12. Let's, we've got 15 verses to read here. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and he said, There were two men in one city. This is the parable, church. There were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had many great flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one ewe lamb which he bought and nourished. And they grew up together with him and his children. He would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb, prepared it, for the man who had come to him. Now look at verse 5. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had, don't miss, no compassion. Nathan then said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel. It is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household 
I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. And the Bible says Nathan went to his house. God bless a prophet that's willing to stand before a king and share truth to that king. Let's pray for just a moment. Father, in the next few moments, uh, I pray you'll help me. This is tough stuff, but it's truth. And God, truth is so desperately needed today from the pulpits in our nation. A willingness to stand before people and look them in the eye and say, you are the man, you have sinned against God. We need that. So we need the story. Father, we need this parable. And over the next three months, God, I pray that you'll be honored by and you will bless the study of our teachers and that, God, you will bless as we share your truth with the faith family at Indian Springs Baptist Church for your honor and your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. When David faced Nathan, And when Nathan said, you are the man, David faced a mirror, and David saw himself. And then David looked through a window, and David saw the heart of a holy God. And David did what believers should always do when they look in a mirror, and when they look through a mirror, and look through a window, he repented. I don't know if you caught the pronouns that were used here. I, when I study a passage of Scripture, I, I always look for pronouns. I, I, I don't know. I like he and she and they. I, I like pronouns. There were five pronouns where God said, I. I did this. I did this. If that had not been enough, I would have. Four times, God pointed a finger and said, you, you, you. You see, parables won't leave you alone. Parables force you to look in front of a mirror And parables force you to stand in front of a window. And parables force you to ask yourself, is this me? Is this God? So what are the takeaways then? What what can we get? What are some of the applications we lift? Because uh, the the main heart of this parable is when Nathan pointed a finger and said, you're the man. Well, how does that apply to us then? Well, let me throw out a couple things. The first thing that, that hit me is this, that Idle time is dangerous for a man. You see, when David should have been out leading his men, when David should have been out fighting, when he should have been in the trenches with his people, David was window shopping. Now, I know some of you say, well, he went out on that roof. He didn't know Bathsheba was going to be there. He shouldn't even have been on the roof. He should have been out in the field. He should have been in the trenches fighting with his people. He had no business being in Jerusalem. He had no business being out on the roof at night looking. A man left to himself without accountability is a dangerous man. Listen to me, guys. A man left without accountability is a dangerous man. We all need accountability. That's why we're trying to start to develop these small discipleship groups. That's why I say to you men and I say to you ladies, you need somebody that's willing to speak into your life. You need accountability. Yesterday, I was out walking in my neighborhood, and I have a friend who lives in my neighborhood. And I'm not going to tell you his names, but his abbreviation is Wayne. And uh, I, I, Wayne came out, and I was talking to Wayne, and I said, oh, by the way, Wayne, I've noticed you haven't been in church the last two weeks, you know. 
And I said, I know you had some excuses. And we laughed a little bit, talked a little bit. And, and the abbreviation Wayne said to me, hey, that's okay. I like accountability. I need accountability. He's right. I, I actually, I told Wayne, I said, you and his, the other abbreviation of his wife is, is Tina. I said, uh, you know, if I were you, I, you and Tina ought to start moving around different places. Because I know where you sit, you know. Accountability. Everybody needs accountability in their life. A man left to himself without accountability is a dangerous guy. I've told you before that when I travel, no matter if I'm with my wife or my family or whatever, there's a guy in our church who I can set my clock at 9.30, 9 or 9.30. He's going to call me and he's going to say, what are you doing? Who are you with? What are you watching? What are you reading? See, when I read this parable, I thought, where was the accountability for David? The second thing that we can lift out is this, that a look became a lust. And without discipline, it became a sin that multiplied into a family and a nation. Now, church, listen to me for just a moment. Let me get real honest and practical and uh, with you as best I can. When the Bible says, flee fornication. When the Bible says, flee youthful lusts. When the Bible says, flee idolatry. The Bible's not saying that to harm us, but to help us. The Bible's telling us that to protect us and to protect those we love. Because sin is like a pebble in a pond. When you throw it in, it just has these, these ripple effects and it consumes more and more people. Here's what Satan will do. He'll whisper, ah, just one more look. Just one more drink. One more glance at pornography. One more drug. Tomorrow's a new day and you can start all over again. But he says the same thing tomorrow. And he says the same thing the next day and the next day. And if you were to continue reading, in fact, I would challenge you to, to continue reading, you'll find the consequences of that one more drink or that one more look at pornography or that one more drug or that one more lust and that one more. And you'll see how it engulfed his family and how it engulfed his nation and how it caused incredible pain. I, I was studying, reading this morning my sermon and a piece of paper fell out of my Bible and I, I don't know when I wrote this, but it was something John Calvin said. He said, for so blindly do we all rush in the direction of self-love. Oh, beloved, I tell you, what a, what a truth for us, you see. That's what happens when we let the disciplines begin to slide. Well, let me close with some statements to you, okay? What does this parable teach us? The first thing it teaches us, that sin dulls our discernment. You see, when you're caught up in sin, you don't, you, don't, you don't think right. You don't realize that God's Spirit may be speaking to you, that the Word of God may be addressing you, that the parable, if that's what it is, might, might be uh, this, this light that's going to be convicting you of your life. It, it dulls your discernment. You don't even think right when you're wrapped up in sin. Number two, it dishonors your Lord. You see, when you're wrapped up in sin, you, you run from God and you run from God's people. The very one you need to run to and the very ones you need to be with, you run from. Invariably, when something happens, someone will say, well, I, I can't go back to church. Uh, everybody knows. Well, the fact is, nobody knows. And it's not about other people anyway. It's that God knows. And that's where the conviction is. And that's what you need to run to. And that's who you need to bow before. But sin dishonors your Lord. Sin disgraces your integrity. Your character takes a, takes a hit. Can you recover? Sure you can recover. That's called grace. But let's don't minimize it. Sin disgraces your integrity. It hurts who you are. It, it hurts your, your name. My daddy used to say, you're a Williams. 
The only thing you got in your lifetime is your name. And he had found out now that I'm getting old, he's right. We don't have money. In the way. It's just all we have is a name, you know. I don't know if you can live in, in retirement in that or not. But you have a name. But when you're caught up in sin, it, it disgraces your integrity. Number four, it damages those you love. Gang, listen to me. Sin damages those you love. There's consequences. I'm so thankful for grace. David, David repented. David was forgiven. But listen to me. He lived with pain. And the parable teaches us. These parables we'll be looking at teach us that we don't have to do that. If we're willing to face the mirror and if we're willing to peer into the window. What did David do? He repented. And that's all we can do. He lived and he led consequences, sure. But if you continue to read David and all of the consequences, you find that God's grace was there to help him. And then David did something that we should be very appreciative of. David went back to writing songs again. Uh, Read Psalm 32. Jot down Psalm 32. Jot down Psalm 51. David said, I have sinned against God. And God said, you're forgiven. And out of the quietness of that year of cover-up and no telling what's going on, you can read in the Psalm some of the things. David's pretty open with his life, how he struggled through that. You find him writing songs again. You see, sin will make you lose your song, people. But forgiveness, repentance and forgiveness gives you your song back. And so where do we end up with? Well, I think a couple things maybe. Uh, Number one, you don't have to do and you don't have to sin if you'll look in the mirror if you'll peer through a window. You don't have to. But if there's some things in your life, then the God that forgave David is the same God that will forgive you. Okay? Grace is sufficient for every moment, for every need. And so I want to encourage you in two areas. Number one, put up your guard. Grab your accountability. Find somebody that will love you enough to look you in the eye and hold you accountable in areas of your life. Go to somebody. It may be someone older. It may be someone, I I don't know who it is. But I know that I'm your pastor. And gang, I'm telling you, I need men in my life. I need accountability. And I need men who are willing to speak into my life. And then secondly, if you've messed up, remember God's grace is sufficient. And I, if I were you, I would suggest maybe something like this. Just just bow before him and say, God, I've sinned. I've sinned against you. And as you repent, believe that God's grace is sufficient to forgive. If it wasn't for grace, if it wasn't for forgiveness... Where would we be, huh? Where would we? And frankly, I'm, I'm just I'm glad that uh, God didn't put my life in a book <laughs> for people to read. I'm glad it was David, you know. I'm glad it's not Tom. Well, let's bow for just a moment, okay? Needs to repent. Needs to accept your grace. Or certainly needs to have person that will speak into their life. And I pray in Christ's name.